Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays at the De Young. I'm so pleased that you've joined us tonight. My name is Francesca D'Alessio. My team and I created Virtual Wednesday programs to encourage us all to connect through art in unexpected and meaningful ways. As we shelter in place, these weekly programs will introduce you to various artists, thought leaders, and museum staff. Join us every Wednesday at 5 p.m. as we aim to highlight unique viewpoints to reframe our exhibitions and collections. This program celebrates the launch of the De Young's new podcast series called Local Voices. The first eight episodes will focus on local artists inspired by Frida Kahlo. Our incredible host, Rio Yanez, has been a wonderful collaborator and thought partner. He was born and raised here in the Bay Area by art royalty. His mother, Yolanda Lopez, is a renowned painter, printmaker, and activist. And his father, Rene Yanez, a painter, performance artist, curator, and community activist, was one of the founders of Galleria de la Raza. Rene Yanez brought Frida Kahlo's art to the Bay Area for the first time in the 1970s. Let's explore the impact of Frida Kahlo's art locally and welcome Rio Yanez to Virtual Wednesdays. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the next in the series of the De Young Museum's uh, panel programming for the, their, their Frida Kahlo exhibition. My name is Rio Yanez. I am your uh, host and moderator. And it's my pleasure today to be talking to the Twin Walls Mural Company and the Great Tortilla Conspiracy. Uh, two very exciting, very interesting collectives uh, operating here in the Bay Area. And we are going to start with, uh, with the Twin Walls Mural Company. Uh, so Twin Walls is Marina Perez Wong and Elaine Chu, and I'm so excited to be talking to them today. Um, so Twin Walls uh, have been, Twin Walls, how long have you, you all been around? Because I, I feel like I, I've seen your work collectively and individually for many years, but you know, what was your, your you know, Spider-Man bitten by a radioactive spider origin story? <laughs> uh, well, I grew up in the mission, actually. So, you know, I'm sure we actually met probably when we were little because um, my mom knows your dad and, you know, you know, the mission. The mission. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I started just not painting till I was 25. 25, 23, I don't know, something, my early to mid 20s with Presida, but before then I was just volunteering a little bit. Um, and I actually met Elaine in high school because we both went to the San Francisco, sorry, San Francisco School of the Arts, now Ruth Asawa School of the Arts. Um, but yeah, we started, I mean, so we've known each other since high school and then, uh, both worked for Presida Eyes, uh, muralists individually. Um, and then we, I came, I moved back to the Bay Area in, uh, 2009 and then, uh, we started painting again together. Susan put us on, uh, Susan Cervantes of Presida Eyes. She had put us on, a uh, do like two or three projects together and we realized we just had so much fun and I was so happy that Elaine was back home and you know our dynamic when we paint was really different than we had painted with anyone else and we just recognized how much fun we mm -hmm. had. <laughs> we just vibe off of one another and uh, we compliment each other. It's my uh, better half. Yeah. <laughs> Same. So um so yeah, and then we formed uh, Twin Walls, it's been seven years? Uh, yeah, no? seven years. Seven years. Uh -huh. um, our friends, Joe and Jordy, actually um, suggested it to us when we were going to do some signage for them. And we thought, why not? Yeah. Why didn't we think of that? Can we do, <laughs> can we do that? Is that possible? So, yeah. and then from there, um, you know, we, we paint a couple murals a year. And then just in the last couple of years, we're uh really started to um get really busy i came home thinking that we were just gonna have one or two projects in the summer i was living in new york we were working by coastally um on um projects and then i came home for those two projects and then those two projects snowballed into like 16 that year yeah <laughs> so um, i just never went home yeah it's been nonstop, and well yeah. i never went back to new york this is home yeah yeah. And the Frida mural we did um, bi-coastally, you know, Marina came for a, a 
a week, week <laughs> two weeks. I took one day off for my yeah. birthday. We did it in six days. While she was living in New York, and so we thought, oh yeah, we can we can do this, but you know, it's so much better to have her home. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're so lucky <laughs> to yeah. have her back. I'm happy to be back. <laughs> so for those of you that don't know, uh, La Flor de la Vida, which is the Frida mural you have on, I believe it's 25th and Valencia. Um, orange. orange, 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 excuse me. Got to, got to rep those little alleyways. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, around the corner from Frida's closet, uh, holds a special place in my heart because, uh, it's just a block away from my childhood home. Uh, my mom still lives there. So, uh, mm-hmm. I see it every time I, I go back to the mission to visit her, but Tell me, tell me a little bit about the kind of decision-making process and design process for that mural. I mean, it, it's now become such an iconic part of the neighborhood. And, you know, it, it's something that, you know, I, I look forward to seeing every time I, I go into the mission. Uh, share with us a little bit about kind of what, what decisions went into designing the mural. Uh, well, initially, um... Elaine sent me the measurements and we discussed it. I sent, I think, uh, I just researched a lot of images of her that we, you know, we felt connected to. Um, And then we discussed, you know, how we wanted to show her uh, visually. She's really important to us. And we wanted to make sure that it was a photograph that showed kind of her, her strength, but also her vulnerability. Um, because she's so dynamic that she has both um, and it shows in her work but in, in her life and her personality too um, and yeah it's a different kind of pose um, than you normally see uh, people painting her as and um, you see her spirit like that's kind of that was really important to us and also the spirit of the mission so it was our our also representing the mission um, and how we wanted to do that in that mural. Um, she's, you know, she's in black and white, um, kind of as a memorial to her. She's obviously not living anymore, but she's present forever for us, especially in the mission, especially as young women of color who are artists who grew up, you know, in the Bay, you know, in the mission. Mm-hmm. But, um, and then we uh, chose the dahlias. Yes. Because, they are the San Francisco flower, but they are also immigrated from Mexico. So they're, they're the national flower of Mexico, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, we had other flowers too, some that were native and the mission blue butterflies uh, uh, yeah. to represent, you know, our kind of legacy in the, in the same aspect as the neighborhood changes. Um, they're only on the San Bruno mountain right now. I mean, there's habitats that are being restored, but they, they used to be in the mission too. So kind of still trying to hold down roots in that light. And then the animals. <laughs> was, uh, my, my cat that uh, I had for 10 years, she's, she's in there. But we loved how Frida would put um, her animals in the mural. So you're her babies. So yeah. Yeah. So we have um, Drew, the little cat. And, and then, then we named the monkey Francisco because he looked like a mischievous little city boy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and we were asked um, to put some names of um, people that had passed that, you know, were in the mission, that lived in the mission. And so in the ribbon, uh, that's where the names are. Yeah. And, then, uh, and we wanted to dedicate it to our um, high school senior um, instructor, Marsha Pannon because she was our first art mom um, and she was such a strong and vulnerable presence in our life also. So somebody who, you know, encouraged us and, and was influential, you know, almost just as much, if not more as, as Frida. So mm-hmm. we had to pay tribute to her as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, wow. dedicated to her. And as artists, do you recall the first time you really were, became aware of Frida's work? Uh, her aesthetics, like, w- was there a time when you saw something by her and it left a, a lasting impression on you? 
Yeah, you know, I think I remember a show, might, might have been at the De Young uh, of uh, Frida's work, and it was um, really influential to me just because seeing her vulnerability um but also her strength and her you know how painting has kind of healed her and helped her through all the struggles that she um went through in her life um and so you know marina and i uh feel that way about painting too and how um we want to manifest what we wish to see in the world through um you know through painting so, and it's helped us with our own um, struggles too. And, you know, I remember like just being a kid growing up, um, seeing her work. I mean, my mom was a photojournalist when I was growing up and uh, a lot of her friends were muralists, um, and painters. And having seen her work, it really resonated with me on a personal level because, um, I had a childhood cancer. It's not the same at all, but, um, you know, being, being an injured person, being somebody who has to work on their wellness. And then, you know, also layered with the fact that, you know, I was told I couldn't have kids um, since I was little. And that always really, you know, made me really sad. And I, I kind of always had that in my head too, that I, I connected with her because I always connected with animals too on the same wavelength. They were all my babies and, um, you know, just, being someone who translates that pain in, into their their artwork, into a visual art form. And even her style has been, I think, really influential for both of us. The fact that she's really detailed and refined, but loose at the same time. Mm -hmm. And her colors. It's all these saturated, intense colors. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we, we definitely put that in the mural, um, you know, just to show her her color her, the saturation of color and the life in her paintings Very yeah. cool. what are you you both uh working on together collectively and individually well, well <laughs> we just finished a project but it's top secret so yeah we can't talk it's about a big it one yet, but it's a big one and we're excited to share yeah. when we can share it but today we dropped off paint because we are just going to do a, a small um, little residential um garage door that's, in the mission so. yeah it's like right up well it's right above the worst part so. yeah we're, we're staying busy um mm -hmm. and uh, it's been a it's been good for us because you know with covid and we're we're just finding release through painting yeah. Yeah, so. and how is your your approach to making murals has it changed much in the last several months uh just in terms of taking any sort of safety precautions or mm -hmm how you interact with folks. Um, is, is, is there kind of a, a different system or structure you use now? Well, we did have to wear masks for this entire project, which was not this fun. Was hard, yeah. Because we were inside and it was protocol for that, that location that we wear masks. Um, and it was just a team of four, you know, Elaine and I and our friend Priya and one of my former students, Lisa Max. Um, but you know, even still like, the, you know, security measures, we had to wear masks. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as far as like normality, I mean, we, we pretty much run the show, however, yeah. which way the wall takes us. I mean, yeah. if it's a smaller wall, we tend to work a little differently than how we would on a much larger wall. Yeah, but we, you know, we do what we can. We wear gloves and masks and um, we don't work when it's really bad outside because yeah. we're actually supposed to start today and mm -hmm. we're not going to work in the, no. the bad air with the air quality the way it is. Um, so it's been changing in that way. Uh, just I'm more uncomfortable, like more annoying to have to, you know, wear all the mask the whole day. And uh, but at least we're painting. <laughs> yeah. And thankfully, Elena and I still have like that mental connection. We don't actually have to see each other's faces. We already know what we're talking about. Yeah, that works out. <laughs> how do you, as someone who works collaboratively on murals, how do you determine like who does what, or or how do you kind of divvy up the aesthetics of the mural when you work together? It's really easy for both of us when it's just us two, mostly because mm -hmm. um, you know on our projects it's always really. I don't know. We feel like it's like a, I think it's pretty even. 
Yeah, I mean, we we know our strengths, and um, you know, like Marina's like, I think you should do that, and I'm like, you, you should definitely paint that. Yeah. Even if we both can paint it, like yeah. we know who would do it better for the wall specifically. Mm-hmm. So there's and, no ego. Yeah, there's no ego. Like, yeah. We love both. I love her work. She loves my yeah. work, and you know, and honestly, we've tended, we've grown together. So um, our work, I think, has changed. Um, yeah. Mine has become more loose a little bit. Elaine has become tighter. A little tighter. Yeah. Um, whereas before we were opposite. Yeah. Now we're, yeah. we're like even more right. balancing each other out. Yeah. We, we learn from each other all the time. And um, and I think, you know, challenge each other uh, um, all the time as well. And so each project, I feel like we're getting more and more in sync and tighter um, in a good way. And uh, concept wise, too. Like, I feel like our concepts are getting um, more uh personal Mm -hmm. um but also with covid there's a lot of uh things going on that are inspiring us as well very cool well thank you both um i'm going to switch over now to the great tortilla conspiracy thank you now uh i'm very very lucky to be a member of the great tortilla conspiracy and this is a bit of a homecoming uh, we got our start at the De Young Museum at what was the Kimball Gallery at the time. And uh, the founding members were uh, Joss Sands, my father, Rene Yanez, and myself. Uh, later on in our storied history, we w- were joined by the amazing Art Hazelwood. And together we have been producing artwork and political graphics on tortillas and handing them out at art events, parties, um, public protests, um, large art museums and very small galleries and everything in between. Um, And uh, I think to start things off, um, Joss, you were, were kind of the, you know, the catalyst to starting the Tortilla Conspiracy. I remember uh, there was an event at the Mission Cultural Center and you were uh, producing images uh, with a heat press onto tortillas. And uh, my dad and I saw them and were totally blown away. Like my dad took this tortilla you made and um, put it on his shelf and would just look at it and stare at it and study it. And I think kind of deconstruct it in in his head. Uh, And several years later, we got an opportunity to, to uh, work together and to produce uh, and embrace tortilla art as a form. Uh, so Joss, tell us a little bit about your kind of inception of tortilla art. Well, actually Rio, I remember that first event really well. And I need to get in the camera, right? I remember that event really well. And I remember the thing that sticks out of my mind most about the first event was that you stuck your finger in the press. <laughs> and I, I have the finger here to show people. And, yes. And I want people to know that a lot of sacrifice went into founding this group. Yes, as, as you can see. I would like to say that if people haven't noticed, I'm actually in my studio from the Guatemala, from the Guatemalan jungle. And I'm broadcasting from there today. Well, I want people to understand that the the great tortilla conspiracy understood conspiracy before conspiracies were even recognized. And from that point, I think, you know, we have produced art that, that tried to ascend above the, the really degraded politics of the time. And we infused our work with politics, but we also infused them with care and love and a love for the community. The tortillas were always free. The tortillas were passed out liberally to feed people and to nourish them both in their bodies and in their souls. Thank you. All yes, right. we, we like to say that um, the, the tortillas, if you eat them, they're food. If you keep them, they're art. So whatever your needs are at the moment, you, we try to fulfill those needs. I would like to add also that there's a, there's a really interesting prehistory to tortilla art that uh, 
goes back to the appearance of the Virgin on a tortilla. And, uh, and then in the mission at the Galleria de la Raza, the Jose Montoya branding of a tortilla. So I'm sure that Rene, Rene Yanez was aware of this history and probably the two, I always think of the tortilla conspiracy as the two minds of Rene Yanez and Joss Sanchez coming together, uh, Rene with his vision and Joss with his technical expertise. Um, and I didn't come in until much later, so I'm sort of like the, uh, I don't know, the Ringo star of this, this group. <laughs> you were Ringo's replacement. <laughs> right. Um, there is indeed a long history of tortilla art. Um, we definitely salute the godfather of tortilla art, Jose Montoya, who um, took kind of like the cue from, from kind of Catholic apparitions and began um, burning images into tortillas and he would use a, a, a hot coat hanger, he would use matches, he would use different things to create images on tortillas. And from there we have um, uh, kind of spread out into different avenues of um, producing work on tortillas. Oh, there's one of my designs um, and political graphics. And, um, you know, it's been very interesting to see how tortilla art has evolved over the years. Uh, Joss, can you tell us a little bit about the technical evolution of how you've managed to produce images onto tortillas? Um, it took, a, it's amazing because I've been screen printing for 40 something years and it took forever to figure out that we could actually screen print edible ones, which really was the kind of, was our renaissance and the enlightenment. Cause we had been doing them with paint. We had been doing them with digital transfers. We had been doing them all these different ways. And once, and I think it was, I had a discussion with Renee and I said, you know, Renee, I think I can mix something that I can print through a screen that you'll actually be able to make a print and eat it. He said, you're kidding. I said, no, I think we can. And I think actually the first tortillas we printed, I used, I boiled some beets and used the beet juice and the um, tomato paste and mixed a red color that printed beautifully. And I still can use that. But now you'll see uh, to print kind of the normal, the, the chocolate ones that we do now, which has become our standard because the images look so good in that. I mean, I'm actually, I'm able to print really fine detail on to a tortilla, which it, it kind of combines this. So it makes, it makes the whole thing seem more magical. And so over the years, all these people come up and see us printing on these things. They can't believe we're making these really detailed images on a tortilla and they can either eat them or take them home. I mean, I have some that are, they're almost 20 years old now. And um, and they, they last, they're archival, and, and as long as they don't get wet, like any print, uh, they're going to be fine. So that's, but at any rate, I, I do remember first running that by Rene, and him being very ex super excited about the idea that we could actually eat them. <laughs> and Art, I mean, for you, as, as you know, how do you see the intersection of tortilla art and political graphics um, and kind of the, the distribution of tortillas as political art? Well, um, I, I look at the tortilla conspiracy as a great way to interject politics using satire. And satire doesn't always work. Humor doesn't always work in political art. Um, we've printed, as you said, at a lot of political demonstrations. We've printed on the street. One of my favorite times was when we printed at um, the drug users clinic in the Tenderloin and gave out tortillas in front of the drug users clinic. You had a Godzilla eat the rich tortilla, I remember real. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, and there's a real connection that you make when you're feeding people. I think that, that um, one of the slogans on, on our uniforms is from uh, the Black Panthers, serve the people. And 
there are, though maybe not completely conscious, there are a lot of roots in the different movements in San Francisco, like the Diggers and the Black Panthers. I mean, it just in the sense that we are providing something for people for free. And I think at the very base of it, the modeling of the free and that we are giving freely to people, we're not asking for anything from people, is a political act in itself. It's kind of modeling a, a world that we want. Interesting, interesting. So definitely one of the kind of icons that we have put on tortillas in multiple ways and, and multiple fashions is Frida. Um, my own Frida art has adorned plenty of tortillas. Um, Joss, I wanted to throw to you, do you have a, a, a specific Frida tortilla that sticks out in your, your head or that, that's a favorite of yours? You know, there's been so many. I mean, again, Frida, she is probably one of the dominant images. And today when I look through, and I have lots and lots of the old film positives, the film positives are the things you use to burn the silk screen, which we use to print. So these are a couple of the film positives. And this is the Frida I was going to try to print today, which is actually, it was one of the rare ones that had a picture of both Renee and Frida in it. And... I actually don't have a clue. Is this your, is that your design art? It is. Can I give the backstory for that? Sure, go ahead. Um, I believe there was a article, I don't know if it was in the Chronicle or something like the Chronicle, which there's a lot of things like the Chronicle these days. But um, there was an article in which uh, Rene was responsible for bringing Frida to the mission. Um, so there was this idea, the way the article was written, it sounded like they were living together, visiting the city together, this kind of thing. So I, the image that that is based on is uh, I took Renee's head and put it on top of Diego Rivera. So that's <laughs> Diego Rivera's body. Um, just because of that article was so like completely off on the time scale. You know, it is amazing that Rene was one of the first people to bring Frida to the city. And, and he had a whole show put together and I think he was rejected by San Francisco MoMA to, sh to show the Frida work. And I think they, they, their response was like, well, nobody knows who Frida is, she's nobody. And Rene was one of the first people who really recognized her as a really, really important artist. And I think that's something that has been kind of missed in all this. Hopefully- but the young but, is going to recognize some of that, but again, they never yeah. met. They never met. That was the, met. the nature of the article was that they had met. <laughs> well, I, I think it's interesting how, you know, he was both responsible for um, bringing, being part of that group that brought that first exhibit to the West Coast, to the Bay Area, to San Francisco, but also you know, part of that wave of artists that also kind of explored Frida as an icon and, and talked about her, her fashion aesthetics and her iconography. Um, and I think that's something that's kind of followed him in the work that he's done with Frida as well. Um, Joss, I would love if you uh, could share with us a demonstration of how tortilla art is produced and walk us through the process a little bit. Okay, um, well, I showed you the film positive, and then we burn a screen. This is a silk screen, and I have some tape on it, which makes it ugly. But the, the image in the middle is that Frida and Renee image. And we use, I use Hershey's chocolate and black food coloring that I mix into- Top secret a, recipe. A secret recipe into an ink. And I basically will use that to print through the screen onto the tortillas. Um, for those who want to know, I actually am using a 230 mesh screen, which is good for detail and it, it won't blob out on the tortilla. I always use Guerrero tortillas. They're really flat factory made tortillas. They're almost like paper and they're so flat and they print beautifully. So, I, I usually, and I start out, I'll just print one on a piece of paper here, see what it looks like. They, they call that a, 
a proof. And this is a squeegee that pushes the through. And you can see the first print, it's always kind of light, but there's the image. I'm gonna run one more and I think the screen will then be ready to print. And you can see the second print is much darker and beautiful and ready to go. Here's my first tortilla. It's still, it's a little light, but it's pretty good. And you can see the Renee and Frida. All right. So this, again, this is edible from what I made, and I'll, not very really good raw, but they're pretty good. I think it's not too bad. I'm hungry. It's dinner time. We usually cook them. Right. And make quesadillas out of them. No. So I could stand here and print hundreds of these and pass them out, which is what we do. Um, we've, we've done events where in the course of a few hours, we've printed thousands of tortillas that we passed out as art. And we have a lot of events. We kind of gauge, you know, we'll do three or four or 500, depending on the size of the crowd and who's there. And, um, and they're almost always well received. The one thing that's really interesting, you know, for, this is really inexpensive to do to make quesadillas the way we do it. Um, and we have a tip jar out and almost invariably you'll get five or six times as much in the tip jar as you spent on the materials to do it. So in the fact that you give it away and you give people a, a, an opportunity to decide how much they want to give works out. I mean, I think it's, and there was definitely a part of that because Renee, it's funny, Renee is so Chicano in so many ways. And also in the other ways, he's, he was so San Francisco hippie. And he was a beautiful fusion of those, those two confluences. And, and I know nobody sees him that way because he's such, you know, he's so Chicanismo. But but he was also the, that other hippie side too, which, which was more where I came from and what I really appreciated. So, Joss, do you have any memories of those early days, those early Frida shows um, in the early 80s and early 90s in San Francisco? Um, I have, a, in the early 80s, I have a lot of memories of that. I mean, what was going on at Galleria and all this other kind of stuff. And, um, there was, I think, and there was an emergence that happened in the mission at the same time. All these women artists, Chicanas, and emerged and moved forward with their art. Your mother, you know, so your mother came to San Francisco from San Diego and there were many, many, many important women artists that worked there. And I, I think all of them were influenced and in some ways provoked by Frida. I mean, and Frida was a person who, who struggled with her man. And, and there's a kind of feminism that Frida projected that I think is really important. It's, um, and, and, I, and again, I'm, I'm a white guy, so I should probably shut up and not talk about this anymore. But but again, I, I saw this, I, I saw a kind of important Chicana feminism that, that emerged. And I think a lot of it was promoted by Frida. Oh, interesting. Well, Joss, thank you for, for demoing uh, the process of the tortilla conspiracy. Um, can you let us know what projects you have coming up or any sort of exhibitions or activities? Um, I have a, I did a, 
51 foot scratch board of a whale that got a lot of attention at the Richmond Art Center a year ago. It's now um, at, in Lawrence, Kansas. And I'm actually gonna do a Vimeo presentation with someone I'm very excited to do with is Elizabeth Schultz, who's kind of the preeminent Melville scholar, one of the preeminent Melville scholars in the United States. And she's a retired now, uh, a retired professor, and she, uh, you know, past president of the Melville Society, and she's really excited by the whale. And so we're going to do a presentation together, which I hopefully I can send around there and we can see. But I'm really excited, and I, to be with such a brilliant academic is amazing to me. That's happening. I have. I have work in a show that's in Florida. I have just had a print that's going to be in a, a justice, uh, uh, a racial justice show in Minneapolis. So I, I'm getting stuff out there. I mean, I'm, I'm like everyone else. I'm just hunkering down in my studio. I'm an old man. I can't afford to get this disease or I probably will die. So uh, again, I'm trying to stay safe and, and keep my dear partner safe. So, you know, again, I, but, I, but I feel like, you know, we can't just give up. I mean, the most important election of our lives is coming up, of everyone's lives. And, and we have to, and I, I've tried to stay in that and participate and move towards it. So that's what I'm doing. All right. Thank you, Joss. Art, uh, do you have any upcoming projects or activities you'd like to share with us? Well, um, I'm part of the San Francisco Poster Syndicate, which Joss is also a part of, and a lot of political poster makers in the Bay Area are part of. And um, it's got its roots in the tortilla conspiracy to some degree. We used to print live a lot at Actions and give posters away for free in the same way that the tortilla conspiracy did. With COVID, we haven't been able to do that. We've been pre-printing at some of the actions, especially around Black Lives Matter, and distributing posters at some of those actions. Um, right now, we're working on a, um, a project. Several people are making designs for posters about uh, preventing evictions as eviction courts start to reopen. And we are, I'll be printing them because I'm the only one who has access to a studio of the group at this point. Um, and then somebody will be distributing them at the actions. Uh, some of these are car caravan actions. Joss and I both did posters for a, a car caravan action about uh, in support of Uber drivers unionization. So, you know, despite COVID, we're trying to remain engaged politically. And that's, as Joss is saying, the importance of keeping politically engaged despite the challenges is important right now. All right. Well, I'm going to open up uh, to a couple of general questions for both uh, the Tortilla Conspiracy and uh, Twin Walls. Um, going back to Frida, um, what do you, I mean, as artists, what do you feel is kind of leading this kind of interest in her work, in her imagery, in her aesthetics, in her iconography? Um, what do you think is kind of drawing people in to her work in this moment right now? I think the fact that she keeps it so real is um, a huge part. The, that kind of brutal honesty um, is, is something that, you know, people weren't doing as much back then. And now people want it even more. They want the real story. They don't want something sugar-coated. Um, and Frida was raw. She was, um, but also, I think, you know, the fact that women are coming out and speaking up and, you know, being more present and aware of their femininity, but also like, you know, their, you know, their portions of masculinity as well. Like we have both within us. And, you know, whereas a lot of people say that Frida was, um, I don't know, more masculine looking or, you know, she wore pants. That she was, embraced it. She embraced it. Yeah. And it wasn't. I, don't, I think even for Mexican culture, um, women are strong. So it's not something that, that's looked at as separate. Um, and, but I feel like it, it's becoming more like that in society now. 
I would like to add to that that um, besides her keeping it real, she also is, is keeping it surreal in the sense that her symbolic aspect is really important. Um, the way that she uses imagery to uh, create meaning in her work, it's, it's, a lot of it is autobiographical, but a lot of it is, is very transcendent in the sense of the symbolism. And I think that really connects to people because people want some kind of meaning in work. When I, when I think about my dad in the 70s, um, really making that first initial push to establish a, a Frida Kahlo art exhibition, I do think about how psychedelic the 70s were and, you know, the Bay Area at the time and, and kind of the drug culture of the Bay Area and kind of that intersecting with this, you know, this surreal and psychedelic imagery of Frida, but also this kind of deeply personal and autobiographical uh, style to her work. And yeah, it just seemed like the perfect formula to kind of have a catalyst in the 70s um, of just, you know, this very personal work, this very autobiograph autobiographical work, but also just something that's totally surreal and something that's totally in line with the culture of the Bay Area at the time. I think that's exactly right, Rio. I think it's exactly right. I think that nailed it. And again, it was it was one of these hybrid cultural things that was kind of fused that you see all over the place where very different cultures, you know, fuse in the, in, in the art, in the culture, in the food, and you come up with this new thing that's really spectacular. And I think that Frida was one of those things. All right. Well, as we start to wrap up, um, I want to ask something from each of you. Uh, please share with us, please put us up on an artist whose work you've been appreciating, uh, who, whose work has inspired you lately or, or whose work has just kind of kept you motivated to continue producing your own art. Uh, we'll start with Twin Walls. Ooh. <laughs> Boy. Oh, Kadir. Yeah, Kadir Nelson. Yeah, this was pretty, pretty inspirational recently for both yeah. of us. Yeah, um, with with the beautiful illustrations that he's done for like the New York Times and Times and, and yeah, the New Yorker books. children's yeah. books. Um, oh yeah, the New York. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot of depth there that you know. The skill is, of course, there, but the the depth as far as um, what's happening in the current political times and um, just the fragility of children a lot of times is is represented in his work a lot. So, yeah, that's our vote. All right, uh, art. Is there an artist that has uh, spoken to you lately, or that you can recommend that folks check out? Well, I mean, specifically because of Frida, I would like to call out Emmylou Packard, who was a muralist who worked with Diego and was friends with Frida and took a lot of photographs of her as well. And um, her, we're trying, a group of people are trying to put together an exhibition of her work uh, at the same time as the Diego Rivera show coming up. Uh, that would be at the Richmond Art Center. And Emmylou Packard is, is really underrated, underestimated, but a great printmaker and a muralist. So you should check out her work. All right. And Joss, uh, is there an artist that you can recommend someone whose work has spoken to you lately and that you'd like to pass on to the rest of us? This is going to sound really bizarre because there is so many, and I'm actually very connected to the Emmylou Packard thing, but who I admire greatly. I actually lately have been re-looking at Ben Sean and looking at his work. He's a guy from the 50s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and did political art that was really unusual and was really, like Diego, he was once abstract expressionism kind of came to the fore, he was really driven to the back uh, of the bus. And so there's kind of a lot of these people who they said, oh, Diego, he's so illustrative and all. They, they poo-pooed all of them. And now I'm starting to look at 
some of these people that the art world rejected at that time. And, and I think that some of their work is amazing. So it, um, it's just a relook really at kind of, um, you know, 40s and 50s art in America that was really suppressed by, you know, the anti-communist movement. All right, thank you, Joss. Well, before we go, um, Marina, I want to turn things over to you. Um, you've been uh, in the news uh, a lot lately, both for your incredible work, but also there, um, you know, there have been your documented your your health struggles and uh, kind of community efforts to raise money uh, for your treatments, for for kind of new opportunities in in treating your cancer, and I just wanted to check in with you and kind of ask uh, where you can refer people to find out more about that work that's being done and your fundraising work. Yes. Um, well, um, yeah, I, I have stage four metastatic breast cancer. So, you know, it's been affecting both Elaine and I because we work together and I was out of work a lot um, last year, but also I will be this coming year because I have an operation coming up. Um, so yeah, we, my friend Pablo started a GoFundMe. I think you can just look under Marina Perez hyphen Wong. Or um, on our website. Or on our website on Twin Walls. Um, your think, company. Your own company. Or on our Instagram too. You can find the link there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Marina. Um, we're thank all you. really rooting for you and cheering for you. And I'm so glad you could join us today. Uh, my thanks to the Great Tortilla Conspiracy, the Twin Walls Mural Company. Uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, I invite you uh, at home to check out Local Voices, celebrating Frida Kahlo, the podcast that we've been, uh, I've been working on with the De Young. Uh, it's now available on the Fine Art Museum SoundCloud and Spotify. Uh, Spotify. Uh, new episodes uh, will be released every Monday. If you want more information on the featured artists and upcoming events, please visit the DeYoung's website, deyoung.famsf.org. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to send us additional questions and comments to public programs at famsf.com, or excuse me, .org. Uh, this is Rio Yanez signing off. Uh, may your houses be blue and your Diego's be faithful. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs> thank you so much, Rio, and thank you, everyone. That was so much fun. Frida Kahlo, Appearances Can Be Deceiving, is now on view at the De Young Museum. Tickets are selling out fast, so we recommend booking your tickets in advance online at tickets.famsf.org. Again, that's tickets.famsf.org. And please check out our podcast, Local Voices, on anchor.fm backslash famsf. Again, our podcast, Local Voices, can be found at anchor.fm slash famsf. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week.